that I have too. Well, you, most of you are my students. I'll put a bunch of videos that I have. Um, and you guys have them in your announcements too, but it's extra if you need to go over these rules again. So week five discussion is not that bad because it's just list three topics in the course so far that are giving you trouble. Explain why these topics are difficult. And this is good for us to know. List three topics that are the easiest and then share a video. You know, it, it ex extend the discussion. And you can even, if you want, um, talk about an example from the assignment and how to solve it too. You know, anything that helps anyone else with a, that's the goal of the discussion board, right? To learn from each other. So anything that does somewhat of that is, is goal, key, what we would want. So, okay, I have, oh, I just spilled my crumbs everywhere. Okay, <laughs> that's gonna drive me crazy. Okay, <sighs> you guys can see my screen. Yes, wait, let me put my chat up. Let me set myself up. So if you guys do write in the chat, I'll see. <clears throat> All right, so I'm focusing on Yeah, I'm not going to do conditional probability yet. I'll do just the first stuff. <clears throat> okay, so here's what you have coming up with probability. <clears throat> and again, you may have heard me say that probability initially might seem horrible, but it's not that bad. It's just a matter of how you approach it, how you practice it and such. Because like I told you, I used to hate probability, but now I love it. Um, and that's because of that reason. Initially, I had a hard time when I did it <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> and then I learned to and I learned how to look at it simply, and then it was very easy after that. You guys have, I'm gonna just say, these are the topics, topics of week five. Okay. Yeah. And <clears throat> I'm gonna call the first one just basic probability, which, I'll cover, but you know, just finding like the probability of selecting one of something, um, no fancy tricks or anything. I do want to talk about compliments. Maybe I'll do that tomorrow. Let's do the addition rule. Um, and then within the addition rule, you have mutually exclusive events or not. You have the multiplication rule. <clears throat> you have conditional probability. This is the stuff. If I ever say prob, it's probability. And you have the probability of what we call at least one of something. So the uh, and then I'm going to add complementary events, which if I have time today, I'll do. If I don't, I'll do it tomorrow. So I'm going to focus on, OK, yeah, I'm going to focus on the top three concepts today. Oops. And then I'll focus on the last three tomorrow. If I have time to start complimentary events at the end of today, I will. So we'll focus on this today's Tuesday, and then we'll focus on this Wednesday. <clears throat> and um, the multiplication rule, I'm going to show two different ways. I'm trying to think if I want to show the formula for it until I approach um, until I do conditional. I might just do the concept of multiplication rule and then do the formula related to it when I do conditional probability. So, <clears throat> all right, let's say that, okay, 
have a deck of cards in my videos. So let's just start with the bag of. Hmm, let's roll the dice. Rolling a die, a single die. And let's say that this die, and anytime, and I learned this, dice is plural for more than one, and die is singular. There's one, and it has six sides. Six sides. <clears throat> All right, so. Um, Let's just talk about all the outcomes that can happen if you roll a six-sided die. Um, all the possible outcomes that can happen are basically um, what we call the sample space. So we're going to find the sample space of this particular procedure, which is rolling a single die. I should say once. Rolling a single die once. <clears throat> How many outcomes can I get? So, you know that a single die is numbered from one to six. So all the outcomes, I can either have a one, I can have a two, I can have a three, I can have a four, a five, or a six. Right? Those are all the possible outcomes. Um, I can't get a seven. I can't roll the die and get an eight. I can't roll a single die and get a zero. I can only get a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, or a six. And I can only get one of them because I'm only rolling it once. Just stop me if you get confused, right? I have the chat up and, and you guys can unmute if you want. So let's find some probabilities, right? <clears throat> let's calculate. Um, your notation, when you're dealing with probabilities, you're going to see capital P in a, in a um, parenthesis. And you might see capital P parenthesis A, which implies find the probability of event A occurring, which I would have to define what event A is. But a lot of what I do is instead of defining event A, I always like to just write it out. Um, find the probability, uh, probability of, let's say, rolling the single die once and getting a two. So in my in my case, I'm defining A to be getting a two. But I'm just writing it out like this. Sometimes you might see A is defined as getting a two, rolling a single die once and getting a two, and then you want the probability of A, which is the same thing as the probability of getting a two if you roll it once. Well, when you're doing probability this way, when you're calculating it this way, you're always calculating it such that <clears throat> on the top, how many ways can I get a two? Well, if I have a single die with six sides, there's only one two, and I'm only rolling the die once, so there's only one outcome rolling a two. But there are six total outcomes. So whenever you're finding basic probability, it's always how many ways can you get what you want out of how many total ways or how many total outcomes you have. So <clears throat> this can be represented as a fraction. This can be represented as a decimal, one out of six. Point six, and then look at how you're rounding. Typically, three to four digits to the right of the decimal. Point one six six. I'm gonna go three. Point one six seven. So zero point one six seven approximately, or it could be represented as a percentage. Okay, so I can represent a probability in a fraction form, in a decimal form, or in a percentage form. OK, and, you know, you'll be told which one to do. I think typically a lot of them are the decimal form. Um, some of them might be fraction form. I think most of them percentage form. And then if they ask you for percentage form round, I don't think they have a lot of. I'm sorry, not a lot of percentage form. They have mostly decimal form. Round to four digits, round to four, round to four, round to four. OK, <clears throat> so. 
What if I ask for the probability, and let's say event B is rolling an even number, and I want the probability of event B occurring. Well, how many uh, even numbers do I have? I have two, four, and six, right? I'm only rolling the single die once. I don't have to worry about rolling it twice right now. I'm rolling it once. So there's only three even numbers in that sample space out of the total six, right? It's always how many ways can I get that out of the total six or out of the total outcomes. In this particular case, six outcomes. And I can simplify this one half or 50.5 or 50%. So this is like, like basic probability concepts, right? Um, you're not doing anything crazy, um, but I wanted to show this for the sample space, all the possible outcomes and then the basic idea, right? Obviously I can add to that, but Let me do a bag of marbles. I have a bag of marbles and I have hmm, 10 blue marbles. I have four red marbles and I have, hmm, let me make it even, six purple. Okay, I have my bag of marbles. And in my bag of marbles, let's say I want the probability that, again, I'm only going to select one marble at random. You're going to hear a lot selecting one versus selecting more than one. And you're going to hear at random because it has to be at random. Otherwise, these calculations don't make sense. Once I know something more and it's not random, the probability will change. We're doing it at random. Find the probability that I select one marble, and that one marble is a red marble. Okay, does anyone want to try it? <laughs> I'm checking the chat too. So it would be out of 20 marbles, you get four chances to find a red? Yep. So my probability would be four possibilities of this particular scenario out of 20 total, uh, uh, in this case, 20 total marbles, 20 total outcomes, right? And so that's my probability, which can be simplified as one fifth, which I believe is 0.2 or 20%. Good, any questions? I'll do one more. Find the probability. Then I randomly select. This is only selecting one now. And I get a purple. What's that probability? Twenty to one? I have how many purple? Six out of total 20. Mm -hmm. And that's the probability. And then I simplify this. It's always how many possible of what you want in this particular case, how many purple out of how many total? In this case, how many red out of how many total? How many purple out of how many total? If I want, let's say, blue, what's that one? 10 over 20. Mm -hmm. And obviously you'd want to simplify. So this is one half or 50% or 25. And then this two goes into six, three times, two goes into 20, 10 times, and then 0.3 or 30, blah, 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 right? And if you're noticing, which I hope you're noticing, most of these are fractions where the numerator is less than the denominator. They're called proper fractions, which would make sense, right? You know. In this particular case, I can't get more than six particular outcomes. So I should not have a probability that has a numerator that's bigger than the denominator because it doesn't make sense. There's no such thing as getting more than what's possible. 
So we have, um, you know, requirements. I'll put them up here. You know that any probability, probability of any event, we'll call it A, um, must be a value or a fraction that is less than or equal to one, but also greater than or equal to zero. Has to be a decimal bigger than zero or equal to zero, but less than one or equal to one. <clears throat> How would I get one? Let's see. Let's go back to this one. What if I said, what's the probability of rolling a six? I'm sorry, rolling <laughs> uh, a number from one to six, inclusive. <laughs> well, how many possible ways can I roll a number from one to six? Well, I'm rolling a one or two or three or four or five or six. I get six possibilities, right? Six ways that this can happen, but only six particular outcomes. So I'm talking about the whole sample space, which is the only time that I get one or 100%. <laughs> What's the probability of rolling a seven? Not. Can't happen. There are zero sevens out of six total outcomes, and zero in the numerator of a fraction gives you zero. Zero percent chance of that happening. We call this one an impossible event. We call this one a certain event. But it doesn't matter if you calculate a probability that's 99.99999%, you never round it to 100%. Because if it's not certain, there's a probability that it won't happen, even if it's a tiny, tiny percentage. So we only say it's one or 100% if it's certain to happen like this. I'm gonna get a number between one and six inclusive. So that is gonna happen if I roll it once. This is impossible because I'm, I'm talking about a scenario that's not possible. There's no outcomes that match that from my particular procedure. My procedure in this case was rolling a single die. Over here, what if I ask you for the probability of selecting, <clears throat> hmm. what's the probability of selecting one pink marble? Not certain. <clears throat> it's zero pinks yeah. out of 20 total marbles. Zero happening. It's not happening. It's an impossible. No so what I call these like basic probability concepts, right? We're selecting one, you know, um, no, no particular crazy stuff happening, right? Let's see if you can do this one. And I believe you can, but I'm gonna tell you what it means. What is the probability? Now I'm still selecting one marble. What is the probability that I select? A, Oh, let me keep color coordinating. <laughs> a blue. Or. Let's go purple because I don't really like red. Blue or purple. <laughs> let me see if you could do that. Th try it for a second. I mean, I'm not expecting you to get it right. I'm not expecting you to get it wrong. I'm just try it. blue or purple would it be the probability um would be more blue than purple because there's more to choose from no not really i'm going to this bag and i'm only picking one what's the probability it's either blue or purple so it could be blue or it could be purple either one is fair game either one is what i want i'm not particular um, and plus six yes out of total 20. Yep, it's called the addition rule. When you have the or case, I'm gonna come back to that. So either one is a possibility, either one is fair game, either one is happy and makes, you know, makes me happy. I don't care if it's blue or purple, as long as it's one or the other. So we're including the 10 and the six in our probability in the numerator as our possible outcomes over the 20, which is all the possible. And so that's a 16 out of 20. So we add the two together. And then what, four goes into 16 four times, four goes into 25 times. 
and then convert, right? And then just in case, if you don't know how to convert a fraction, you do numerator divided by denominator and you get a um, decimal. So the fraction bar is like also division bar in a sense, 80%. Okay, let me do one more with this particular case. Um, what is the probability that it is red or blue? So I'm only selecting one again. What's the probability I get a red or a blue? It doesn't hurt to try. You could type it in the chat too, you know. So would it be 10 plus four over 20? So that's 14 over 20. Two goes into 14 seven times. Two goes into 20 10 times. Yep, exactly. Add the two together because it's or. I'm accepting a red and I'm accepting a blue or I mean or <laughs> I'm accepting a red or I'm accepting a blue either one is happy I'm happy with right so I'm going to add the two possible outcomes as my total on the top for this particular scenario out of total possible outcomes in general 14 out of 20 exactly what she said two goes into 14 7 two goes into 20 10 and then 0.7 or 70 percent so you. We cool so far. So far, so good. Questions? We cool, we cool. All right, so let me write out the addition rule. Now, typically when I introduce the addition rule, it's, you know, people, it's like um, intuitive. If you notice, like a lot of probability is intuitive also. Go ahead. Is that for me? Question or no? Okay. All right. Um, because you you know if you hear or you naturally kind of want to add, right? So that's the addition rule. I'm gonna call it the or case. When you hear or, I want this or that, you automatically should think about the addition rule. Now. We did it without looking at a formula, which you could technically do, but I'm going to give it to you um, with the formula just in case. Some of the problems in your assignment might, you know, require you to go through the little formula just because of the notation, but I'll show both. Um, yeah. So the probability of A or B, I'm going to say means the probability of selecting a or B or both. So we did a situation where we called mutually exclusive events. So let me let me give you the main probability here, the main formula. Probability of A or B is the probability of A plus the probability of B, which is what we did here, right? We added the two together minus the probability of A and B. So I have to show you what I mean by this extra little piece, because what we had here, we didn't have that extra little piece. And I'll show you why. If events are what we call mutually exclusive, and if you ever, I'm just gonna ME it, if I, I'm gonna abbreviate it because I don't want to write that all the time. ME is mutually exclusive, which means that they have no intersection. They cannot happen at the same time. Cannot occur at the same time. Which, in this particular case, if I'm only selecting one marble, I cannot select a blue and a purple because that's two marbles. I can only select one or the other, right? I can't, they can't happen at the same time. I can't do a blue and a purple at the same time if I'm only selecting one marble. 
So those would be considered mutually exclusive events. Same thing with this. I'm only selecting one marble. I can't select a red and a blue. They can't happen at the same time. They're mutually exclusive events. So if events are mutually exclusive, then this formula simplifies into just what we did before, P of A plus P of B. There was nothing to subtract because basically that's zero. So we call those mutually exclusive events. I'm going to write that here so you have it. So these are, I'm going to say ME <laughs> and ME. So now, when you hear the OR case, automatically you're going, all right, the addition rule, I'm going to add, but I have to consider whether the events are mutually exclusive or not, because I'm either going to subtract something or not. Let me know if that makes sense. Let me pause for a second. We cool so far? I think Sarah, we lost her. She said it was yeah. great. Hold on a second. I'm writing some stuff down. Yeah, and I'll send this to you after also. <clears throat> So I'm going to do a few examples with this or case. You're going to see typical stuff like a deck of cards. <laughs> I'm going to do a deck of cards. Yeah, let's do a couple. Of okay. Good. Yeah. OK, just looking at some of the stuff that you have to do. All right, cool. All right, <clears throat> so are we cool? Do we know what like a standard deck of cards? Do we know the stuff regarding a standard deck? If you don't, we should. Let's just make sure. I always have somebody that doesn't every semester, everywhere I go. Standard like six pickup. Listen, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I always, it's funny because I don't know if it's old school, because I don't know if kids play with deck of cards nowadays. We used to, yo, deck of cards, but we didn't have phones. So I don't know if these kids play spades or do they play solitaire even? Like, do you remember solitaire? That was very common. <laughs> so I used to tell my students, like, if you don't know a deck of cards, you're going to do probability. You need to know a deck of cards. Go play with it. Go grab one. You can get one at the dollar store and play around with it to see what's in there. You have 52 total cards. You have four, um, I've been forgetting basic words lately. You have four um, sections. Somebody, what's the word? It'll, it'll come to me. You have four different types. You have diamonds. Um, you have spades. Uh-oh. Can you hear me still? I just heard. Can you hear me still? I can. Okay, I heard a noise like it dropped the call, so I just want to make sure. Okay, diamonds, spades, um, hearts, and clubs. Okay, so. <clears throat> um, Actually, I should color coordinate this too. The diamonds and hearts are red cards. Diamonds and hearts. Tell me if this sounds familiar. And then the spades and the clubs are black cards. And guarantee when you do probability, you're going to see something um, with a deck of cards. Typical, like you're selecting something, like you're selecting a marble oops, out of a bag. Um, you're doing a deck of cards. I see a spinner in your stuff. This is all typical type of, you know, probability stuff. So you have four, um, not classes, there's a name for it. And I don't know why it's not coming to me. It'll come to me and I'll just add it there. So you have a total of, so half are diamond. I'm sorry, half are red and half are black. So you have, um, I'll write it under here, 
26 red cards and you have 26 black cards, right? And then the black cards are the spades and the clubs and the red cards are the diamonds and the hearts. Then you have <clears throat> cards numbered from two to 10 of each, what's the term I'm missing here? It's gonna drive me crazy. Of each suit. That was driving me crazy. Is that how you spell it? Suit, not with the E, that's a suite. <laughs> okay, suit, they're called suit. Four suits, diamond spades, hearts, clubs, cards numbered from two to 10 of each suit. So there's cards, so diamonds numbered from two to 10, the spades numbered from two to 10, hearts numbered from two to 10, and so on and so forth. You have um, <clears throat> Jack, Queen, King, and Ace of each suit. And Jack, Queen, and King are considered the face cards. So if you're ever talking about just face cards, it's just Jack, Queen, and King. So technically, there is four of each type of card, so four jacks, because I have a jack of diamonds, I have a jack of spades, I have a jack of hearts, I have a jack of clubs. I have four queens, because I have a queen of diamonds, I have a queen of spades, I have a queen of um, hearts, and I have a queen of clubs. And then, um, you know, four of the number five, I have a five of diamonds, a five of spades, a five of hearts, a five of clubs. So four of each card okay four aces for uh, ace of diamonds ace of spades ace of hearts ace of, right okay um so do we know that we're cool with that this girl wants to do this problem from last week um Okay, I'm gonna do the new material first and then I can go back to old. So, based on that, let's do some problems. I'm going to select, and I'll leave this, um, actually, let me do it here. I'm going to select one card from a standard deck of cards. We're gonna find probabilities. Find the probability that one card is a king. So I'll do this one. Uh, how many kings do I have? I have a king per each one of these suits. So I have one, two, three, four kings. So there are four possible kings out of how many total? 52 total cards. So the probability of selecting one card and that one card being a king, four possible outcomes of this out of 52 total, which I believe is one thirteenth, and I don't know what that is in decimal form. One out of 13. Point uh, zero seven, uh, usually it looks like four decimal, so zero seven six nine. So approximately zero seven six nine, which is 7.69%. Oops if I'm talking percent. Tell me if you're with me. All three of these are fair games, depending on how they ask you for your, um, but it looks like majority is rounding to four. Majority of what they ask for on the assignment. I'm gonna ask you guys, what's the probability of me selecting a diamond? Four out of fifty-two, right? Well, diamonds in each in each suit. Well, if I was talking about a particular card, and I forgot to write this over here, I'm going to write it down. Because I'm taking the fifty-two cards and splitting it into four suits. Let me show you this. Fifty-two divided by four is thirteen. So I have thirteen of each of these. 
Okay, I have four of each particular card, four jacks, four queens, four kings, four aces, four twos, four threes, four fours, four fives, four six, four sevens, four eights, four nines, four tens. But because I have um, 52 cards cut in four suits, I have 13 of each of these. So I do have a diamond, but it's for each of these. I have a diamond for each of these from two to 10, jack, queen, king, and ace. So there's 13 diamonds. Same thing with spades, hearts, and clubs. So if I want the probability of selecting a diamond, how many diamonds are there? Thirteen. Thirteen out of oops, 52 total. Let me go back to my blue. So the probability of selecting a diamond is 13 out of 52. 13 possible ways this can happen. 52 total outcomes. This is one fourth, 0.25. 25%, blah, blah, blah. I might not do it. Uh, I'll write it each time, okay? If it's fraction form, you always want to simplify the fraction. If it's decimal, a lot of times it looks like you're rounding to four, but for probability, we always do at least three or four to the right of the decimal. I want you guys to tell me, what's the probability of selecting a red card? Red. 26 over 52? Yes, ma'am. 26 total red cards, 52 total red, one half, 50%, 0.5, 50%, blah, 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 right? Tell me if uh, that makes sense. Are we cool so far with just that? And we understand a deck of cards, right? Actually, let me do one more before I go into something else. Give me the probability of a face card. I'm selecting one card. What's the probability it's a face card? I didn't tell you how many total faces, but I did tell you that the jacks, the queens, and the kings are all considered face cards. So think about how many of each I have. Four? Four of each. So I have four jacks, four queens, four kings, all of them are face cards, so there's 12 total face cards. Four times three. So the probability of me selecting a face card <clears throat> would be what? Anybody? 12 over 52. <laughs> we'll see if they're there. I mean, look, the more you practice, the better. So if anyone else wants the answer, you can answer. Um, you could put it in the chat too. May, hopefully you're doing it in your head or in your, on your paper or whatever you're doing, because when you try it before I answer it, it makes it better. Right. Um, actually, let me show you something on the calculator. Also, the calculator will simplify fractions for you. This calculator does everything. Um, so if I have a fraction and let's say I'm not sure how to simplify, right. Or I'm lazy, whatever. <laughs> I'm going to show you different ways. Let's say 12 out of 52. So I'm going to do 12 out of 52. It's going to give me the decimal. And let's say I want it in a simplified fraction form. So, and I'll do this a couple times. If I go to math, which is here, this little button here, third from, well, fourth from the left. The first one says arrow and frac. So this is saying convert the last number into a fraction. So if I press enter there, it's saying A and S, with, which is answer, the last answer, convert it to a fraction. That's what this is saying. And it tells me the fraction version of that is 3 13 the most simplified fraction version of that. So the calculator will do, and this is good for the multiplication rule too. Obviously this one we could do by hand, but 1, 2, 3, 0, 8. 0 0.2308 and blah 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 but it can simplify some of these fractions for you too and i'm gonna come back to that again as we start doing multiplication rule when i get there now addition rule let me finish the addition rule let's do this find the probability of me randomly selecting an ace or a jack Okay, here we go. I am on my homework and I see or. 
And when I hear or, I go, oh, addition rule, right? And I know that I'm going to add stuff because the addition rule says add stuff. And I use the addition rule when I have the or case. But I have to think about whether or not the events are mutually exclusive, right? Um, you might be asked that. Sometimes you could just do it without maybe thinking about that if you want to. But I want to talk about it because it's part of process. It's part of the thought process. An ace, a jack. Would you consider um, if I select one card, one card, would you consider getting an ace or a jack? Would you consider those mutually exclusive events? Can I do those at the same time? Can, do they have an intersection? Is there a card that is an ace of jacks? <laughs> It doesn't hurt just to answer. No intersection, right? So you would just add them both together, just like the prior problem? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. um, not everybody likes to be called ma'am, so I don't mean it in a bad way. I don't mind when people do that to me, so don't. <laughs> <laughs> just like think that. it bothers you. I'm not meaning it that way. <laughs> <laughs> but I would call these mutually exclusive events because they cannot happen at the same time. I cannot get an ace and a jack if I only have one card. There's no such thing as a card that is an ace and a jack. So we're doing what she's saying. We're going to add the two together and divide by the total. So we're technically doing the first part of, uh, sorry, the second part of this formula because they're mutually exclusive events. But this is what we're used to because this is what we did here. We add the two cases together and we divide by the total. So there are four aces plus four jacks out of 52 total cards. And so adding the top, I get eight out of 52. And here, here's my little slick thing, eight out of 52, enter. That's the decimal version. Math, number one, if I want the simplified decimal, two out of 13. So it is either 2 out of 13, or if we're rounding, which is probably what we're going to end up doing, 0 0.1538 to 4, 0 0.1538, or if we're doing percentage, 15.38%, blah, 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 blah. Right. Questions? So what you have taught us so far right now, is this going to be basically a good jump start for us to get some of our assignment done because I felt like I was lost. <laughs> so I'm right. hoping this will be like at, at least a good entrance to at least try to get some at least a problem done. Yes, you should be able to get at least a problem done or a few of them. I didn't do the multiplication rule yet, but okay. yeah, you're talking about basic probability. Obviously, we can represent it different ways, um, but it's the same idea. Um, right now, I'm introducing the the addition rule and look like i you have a spinner like i said i'm gonna be back tomorrow to fill in blanks too because there's more that i won't be able to cover today so i want to do one more of the addition rule then i'm going to introduce the multiplication rule so at least we touch base on it um what is the probability of selecting one and that one is a king or a diamond. Now, I hear the or case. I go back to the standard deck of cards. Uh, sorry, I go back and I'll go, that's the addition rule, the or case, if I hear or, this or that. Um, but I'm talking about a king and a diamond. Are they mutually exclusive, exclusive events or can I have an intersection? Can I have a king of diamonds? You can have a king of diamonds. I can have a king of diamonds. It's been a minute since I played with cards, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. But you have a king of each one of these, right? You have a king of diamonds, a king of spades, a king of hearts, a king of clubs. So you do have an intersection of the two. You can have a king of diamonds. So these are not mutually exclusive events. So this, what we're used to with addition, is going to change a little bit because I have this little extra something here. So 
we're going to do it the same way we did before. I have four kings plus. How many diamonds do I have? I have diamonds, 13 diamonds. I have 13 diamonds, but now I have to subtract. I have to subtract the intersection and the intersection is both of them happening at the same time. So the intersection is considered the king of diamonds, which how many king of diamonds do I have? One. 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 <clears throat> so I have to subtract that intersection out of the total 52. The idea is because you're including the king of diamonds in the kings, and you're including the king of diamonds in the diamonds, you're including it, the, the one card two times, and that's not fair. Every card should be represented only once. So we have to subtract one of them so that it's only represented once in our total numerator. That's the idea of why we have to subtract when we do this multiple, uh, the addition rule and we have um, an intersection. You can only include everything once. So you have to subtract the intersection because you included it here and here, if that makes sense. I think next week you start to look at um, tables. I think it's next week. Yeah, you start to look at tables and that helps visualize this too. But <clears throat> if you're calculating something and you have the or case and you have to add <clears throat> and they're not mutually exclusive, meaning they have an intersection, you have to subtract that intersection. How many of that intersection are there, if that makes sense? So what is the 16 out of 52? And then uh, blah, 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 okay? Um, questions? Let me get into the multiplication rule. So in the addition rule, we add. There you go. In the multiplication rule, what are we going to do? <laughs> Multiply. <laughs> in the addition rule, we add. In the multiplication rule, we're going to multiply. Um, I'm seeing that a student called me. Okay. <laughs> okay, just making sure. Um, I want to make sure I'm not missing anyone. I didn't know if she called me because she wanted to get into the session or I'm not sure. Um, <clears throat> all right. The multiplication rule is used when we are selecting more than one. Now I want you to know that there is a formula involved with this, which I'm going to add here maybe tomorrow, because I want to talk about conditional probability tomorrow, <clears throat> which is part of the second assignment and um, not really the first assignment. So I don't want to do too much in one shot, but I hope that, you know, basic probability, the addition rule and the multiplication rule should get you for, through the first assignment, at least majority of it. I'm not going to add the formula yet because it has to do with a little bit of conditional probability notation. So the idea is that we are selecting more than one. And when we are selecting more than one, we use the multiplication rule, which says multiplication, <laughs> which says we're going to multiply. So let me show you what I mean. Um, standard deck of cards, right? Let's just use that again. And then I'm going to switch to something maybe um, from the homework, okay? Uh, first one, find the probability. So I'm going to find the probability of selecting two cards at random and getting, we'll just make it two queens. So probability of two queens if I'm selecting two cards. So I go, I'm reading this thing and I'm like, okay, now it's more than one. Whenever I have 
a more than one situation, which is a multiplication rule. Now I know I'm going to multiply. I have to consider whether my two events are either independent or my multiple events, independent events or dependent events. And independent events, um, the occurrence, I think that's E N C E, the occurrence of the first event. Wow, okay, that's an interesting way to spell first. The occurrence of the first <laughs> event, my brain obviously went faster than my hand, um, does not affect the probability of the second and so on and so forth because you can have more than two obviously and with dependent and i'll show you what i mean with dependent events can i copy and paste this okay the occurrence of the first event does affect the probability of the second and you might hear with replacement or without replacement. And everybody knows this abbreviation, right? With, without. <clears throat> so I'm going to do the same one. Let's say that for the first situation, and by the way, if you're not told with or without, <laughs> um, then assume without, okay? <clears throat> so we'll do it with cards and then I'm gonna do it with one of the example from Okay, sorry, Steve. I'm um, checking the chat. Okay, good. Okay, um, let's go find the probability of selecting two cards at random, getting two queens. I'm gonna just say with replacement. And if you're not, you know, told with replacement, you could be told, you know, when, so find the probability of selecting two cards at random and getting two queens. When you select the first queen, you put it back, then you select the second queen. That's with replacement, right? I go to this deck um, or whatever. <clears throat> this is the difference. I go to this deck and let's say I'm selecting two queens. Um, if I go to this deck and I pick the first queen, but I put her back into the deck, when I go to pick the second card, I still have the same number of queens in the deck, and I still have the same number of cards in the deck. So I'm not affecting, right? I have, where is it? Where is it? So in that particular case, I'm replacing the first one. I'm not affecting the probability of the second because I still have the same number of total cards, and I still have the same number for this particular case, queens versus without replacement i go to this deck of cards and i pick my first queen but i'm like cool i want to keep this card so i'm gonna put her over here and then i'm gonna go try to pick a second queen but now i have less queens and i have less cards so whatever i did on the first event where i selected that queen put her down over here did affect the probability of the second because of the fact that now i have less queens and i have less cards so those are dependent events versus independent events. So again, I'm not going to show the formula yet. We're just going to do um, multiplication just kind of like intuitively. So all right, cool. With replacement, which means independent events. So now I'm not affecting the probability when I do the first event. Now I'm only selecting two cards. And when you're doing a multiplication rule, if you're selecting more than one, you're going to multiply. So what are you going to multiply? Well, if I have two um, cards that I'm selecting, I'm going to multiply two different, we'll say fractions, two different probabilities. The first parentheses is representing my first event. And the second parentheses is going to represent my second event. 
So let's talk about the first event. First event is I go to this deck and I pick a queen. Well, there are four total queens out of 52 total cards. So that's the probability of the first card being selected and it being a queen. Now I put it back. So now I'm going to pick the second card. And I want it to be another queen. But I still have four queens in the deck. And I still have 52 total cards. So I'm selecting two queens with replacement. They're independent events because you can see the probability is not affected. And I could, if I want, represent this in a simpler form to the second power. Because anytime I multiply something by itself, I can represent it with exponents. And so this is where a decimal version of this stuff comes in handy. So 4 out of 52. So look, if I'm going to do 4 divided by 52, close parentheses, your exponent is here, this little like arrow right here <clears throat> pointing up. Not this arrow, this arrow under the clear button. That's your exponent button. So I'm saying the quantity of this fraction, 4 out of 52, that whole thing to the second power is equal to that. Now this is also where I want to show you I could, if I want, represent it in fraction form. And it'll simplify that for me rather than me going, multiplying these big numbers and trying to simplify. That's a pain in the butt if I want it in fraction form, which typically with the multiplication rule, we do decimal form because obviously these numbers grow fast. But if you want, you know, fraction form, it gives you that. But let's round to 4, 0 0.0059 approximately 0 0.0059. This is a very, 0.59%. <laughs> this is a very small chance of this happening. And you know, you wanna make sure that your probability makes sense with you know your situation because most of it is kind of like logical thinking, um, common sense, intuition. You know, if you go to a standard deck, do you expect to, to select two queens in one shot like that back to back? I would say that that's highly unlikely. Um, <clears throat> you know, you go and you, you go and you want to um, bet somebody that you could select two two queens back to back. Person might take that bet because they're gonna be like, "Whoa, there's 52 cards in this deck. You're trying to select two queens back to back. All right, I'll take that bet." I mean, <clears throat> mathematically speaking, statistically speaking, you know that it's very unlikely because it's so small. The probability is so small. Um, but it makes sense, too, with what you would think when you go to a deck of cards, right? So does the probability make sense with what you would imagine happening in real life? You should think about that because it should make sense. Do you guys have questions yet? I'm going to do one more from the deck. Then I'm going to take a problem from the assignment, which they do have a deck of cards, but I'm going to take something else. I'm going to... Just to show, select three cards, just to show three versus two. We'll do three queens, we'll do queens again, but I'm also going to do without replacement. So I'll show if I select more than one, more than two. Um, in this case, I'm selecting three. So the probability of getting three queens, but without replacement. So the dependent event. So now I'm expecting the probability to be affected. But because I'm selecting three, I should have three parentheses. This is the first event, the second event, and then the third, right? I'm not going to write this every time, but all right. I go to my standard deck of cards, and because I'm selecting more than one, I know I'm going to multiply. And because I'm selecting three, I'm going to have three parentheses to represent each card. And without replacement, now I know the probability is affected, so it's going to change. They're dependent events. I can't represent it like this because each one of these fractions is going to be different. The first one, I'm going and selecting a queen, all right? So there's four queens out of 52 total cards. I'm not putting her back into the deck without replacement. I'm keeping her next to me. How many queens are left in my deck? Now I want you to answer me. How many queens are left in my deck? I took one out. Kept her. Three. Three queens. <laughs> Three queens. How many total cards? Fifty-one. 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 Oh. I picked one I out. I did that. I did that. 
<laughs> Sometimes we forget the bottom, uh, the bottom, and we do the top. So now there's three queens, but there's only 51 cards. So see the probabilities being affected. Okay, I kept this card out. So now the third. How many queens are left after that? Two. And how many total cards? Fifty. Yeah. So you can see. This is going to be an interesting calculation. Most of the time, these, you see how, how this can grow so fast. 52 times 51 times 50, we're multiplying. That's going to be a large number. So most of the time with multiplication, we're going to um, put it in decimal form. So let me show you how to do this. Parentheses, 4 out of 52. 4 divided by 52. Close parentheses. Parentheses, you could do it just how this looks. 3 out of 51. Close parentheses open. 2 out of 50. Right? Oops, don't put that in there. That's <laughs> Okay, and then I'm going to multiply. Oh, perfect. Do you see this E thing? I'm going to write this out. You see this E thing. So one point, I'm going to take... Hmm, I'm going to say 1.81, because look at this, this is a big number, so this is going to round up. 1.81, I'm going to put this E negative 4, show you what that means. 1.81, and you see this little E negative 4. This is very important that you recognize this E thing, because remember, a probability cannot be greater than 1. Right? I can't have the numerator greater than the denominator. We talked about that way over back here. I can't have more um, possible scenarios um, outside of the total possible sample space, and right? I can't have more than what's happening. So that 1.81 is a clear indication that scientific notation is here. And scientific notation, if you remember, well, your graphing calculator has it represented with this E. And a negative exponent tells you that it's going to be a smaller number. So this is the same thing as scientific notation 1.81 times 10 to the negative 4, which tells you to move this decimal four places to the left because it's a negative. 0 0.1234, right? I moved it 1, 2, 3, 4 places to the left. This is the probability of this happening, which if I converted it to per, uh, percentage, move the decimal two places to the right, 0.0181%. I would consider that extremely unlikely, right? Extremely unlikely. Tell me if that makes sense. Would we consider that to be extremely unlikely in general too? I'm going to add a problem to this from the actual assignment. Okay. So, does that make sense? I'm going to put my chat. Let me pick up. This is this problem. This is one of the problems from your assignment this week. I'm just going to grab this because I want to show you it's the same kind of thing, but people get tripped up when it comes to this kind of thing, too. <clears throat> I might add to this question. So, again, um, if I'm selecting more than one, right, I'm going to multiply the, the events, and then I have to consider whether I'm replacing situations or not, whether they're independent or dependent. And either you're going to be told that they're independent or dependent, or you're going to be told in, a, in another way with or without replacement, because um, either they're replacing the cards or not. Um, or if you have something like this, which I'm going to show you, I'm going to probably add to this, you automatically kind of assume independent. I'm going to show you what I mean. So this is... <laughs> A uh, question from the assignment, which I didn't, I didn't even read yet. A poll showed that 47.4% of Americans say they believe that some psychics can help solve a murder case. What is the probability and percent form of randomly selecting someone who does not believe that some psychics can, can help murder cases? So 
I'm probably going to do a couple things here. Let's start with representing this in our notation. The probability that a random person believes, and when I say believes, to believe that, oh, maybe I'll write it out, some psychics, um, P can solve murder cases. So I'm not going to write this big thing every time. So if I ever say P of believe, this is what I mean. <laughs> the probability that one person at random that we're selecting, right? This is just one person. 47.4% of Americans say they believe. So if I randomly select one person, the probability that they believe is 47.4% or 0 0.474. So in, in other words, they're giving you the probability that one person believes that situation. So sometimes they do this with um, your problems. They'll say a poll shows that whatever percent of Americans, blah. And then you're asked to, to find something. And, and a lot of times students are like, where do I get the probability? <clears throat> they gave it to you, but this is only for one person. You're randomly selecting one person. And the probability that that one person at random believes is 47.4%. <clears throat> this is a good example of the complementary case. Let me ask you something. It's not believe. If I tell you that, actually, let me come back to that for a second. If I tell you the probability that it will rain tomorrow is 70%, and I ask you, what's the probability that does not rain tomorrow? What are you going to tell me? 30%? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And every time I ask this question, everybody does it that quickly you guys are automatically doing the complementary rule. It's not really a rule, but you're automatically talking about complementary events. And complementary events are basically um, two events that represent the total sample space, right? So it's either going to rain or it's not. There's nothing outside of that. <clears throat> Let's talk about this. Going back to rolling a single die. If I talk about getting a two, the complement of that is not getting a two. It's everything but that. Well, well, let me ask you that then with this. What's the probability of not getting a two? From this particular case, rolling a single die once with six sides. I know the probability of getting a two is one sixth. What's the probability of not getting a two? Everything but a two. Uh, five, six. Five, six. Everything but that. Well, what do you notice? The two of these, they add up to what? One, six, and five. They add up to one, or they represent 100% of the situation. And complementary events always add up to one or 100%. If I say the probability of some event plus the probability of its complement. They represent the complement here for you guys. Complement could be represented a couple ways. Could be like this. Um, this means the complement of A. Sometimes they represent it with like a tick like that. Different ways to represent complements. But the sum of the two events is one or 100%. So what you naturally did was you said, well, let's call this A and this complement of A. <clears throat> and I said, <clears throat> if I manipulate this a little bit with algebra, and I want the probability of A, <clears throat> I can go, well, that's one minus the probability of the complement, or vice versa. You naturally did this, because what you did in your head was you said, all right, well, she told me the probability of some event is 0.7 or 70%. And that's one situation. 
And the other thing she asked me was everything but that. It was the complement of it. So it has to be everything outside of that, but it can't go past the one or 100%. So you naturally did this to give me 30%. So you naturally, um, naturally, intuitively, calculated your complement or event. Um, and when I say one, it could be 100% also, because remember in percentage form, it's 100%. So all this could also be, right, and blah, blah, blah. So it could be percent or decimal, right? <clears throat> so why did I talk about that? I talk about that because when I go here, what's the complement of somebody believing that psychics can help solve murder case cases? Well, they either believe or they don't. So how could I calculate for one person then the probability that they don't believe? If I know that they, the probability that they believe is this, 0.474, if I want to find the probability that they don't believe, which is everything but this, it's like complementary events, right? Let me actually, if I want to call this event A, this would be like A complement, which also could be represented like that just so you know, either notation, I would do the one minus to get everything outside of that. And you could do that on your calculator, right? One minus 0 0.474, 0 0.526. <clears throat> so indirectly, they're telling you the probability of one random person believing that psychics can solve murder cases, but they're also telling you indirectly the probability that one person does not believe because if you know the probability that one person believes you automatically know its complement as well so what is the probability of randomly selecting someone who does not believe 0.526 so this is a way of asking for a complementary event i'm going to add to this though I'm going to add to it. My example extending from this. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Oh, gosh. All right. My example. Okay. I'm going to ask you if I randomly select three people. What's the probability that all three believe this? That some psychics can solve murder cases, can help solve murder cases. I'm selecting more than one person. Automatically, that tells me that I'm going to use which rule when I'm selecting more than one? multiplication rule, right? Whenever I select more than one, I don't have the chat out. Um, I did. Yo, why can't I write today? Multiplication rule. <laughs> okay. <laughs> more than one multiplication rule. And in this particular situation, they are always independent because the probability of this random person believing that some psychics can help solve murder cases should not affect or be completely independent than this person over here that I randomly select, believing that some psychics can help solve a murder case. Remember, they're being selected at random. So these are independent events because one person believing should not affect another person believing because they are random people. <laughs> so there's more than one, and in particular case, there's three of them. The probability that the first one believes believes is 0.474. The probability that the second one believes is 0.74. The probability that the third one believes is also because they're independent events. The probability should not change, which means I could represent it this way, 0.474 to the third power, 0.474 raised 
to the third is point, and we'll go four digits to the right, 1065. There is a 10.65% chance that I randomly go up to three people and I ask them if they believe that psychics can help solve murder cases, and they believe it. 10.65% chance. And anything above 5% is considered likely. So I, that's likely, which would make sense because almost half of Americans say they believe that. So I would imagine that if I randomly go to three, it would be likely that the three of them believe. Not extremely likely, obviously, but somewhat likely. I will stop there because I gave you a lot, right? <clears throat> and recapping. And I actually did this today. I, I touched on complimentary events today. I told you I might, and I did. I did, I did. So this was Wednesday. Tomorrow I'll talk about this. Today I did this. So we talked about complementary events. Obviously we did some basic probability calculations. We talked about the addition rule. And now I can say the or case. And then the multiplication rule selecting more than one. And there's a formula that goes with this I didn't introduce yet because I didn't talk about conditional probability yet, which I will tomorrow. And the only reason I would introduce the, the formula for the multiplication rules because they have a little, like one or two questions that deal with using it, manipulating it. But that other than that, you know, you could do it intuitively. So we talked about some basic probability in different ways, rolling a single die, a bag of marbles. I talked about the or case. And anytime you hear this or that, you go straight to thinking about the addition rule. Um, multiplication rules when you select more than one. So I did a couple different scenarios with a uh, deck of cards. And then um, I talked about complementary events. So <clears throat> with a deck of cards, we did basic probability. We did addition rule and we did the multiplication rule. And then I talked about complementary events, which is what this question asked for, but I added to that to show you how this can also be used to find a situation where we would need the multiplication rule. But it's still the same idea, right? It still simplifies into the same idea. So while probability can seem difficult and confusing, if you break it down into these simple like rules and you just analyze which one it is, and you follow the same thing that you do every time, it should simplify it for you, okay? So when it comes to the assignments this week, you should be able to do the first assignment, <clears throat> maybe until the last problem, because the last problem does talk about a little formula with dependence that, with a conditional probability, but and then the next, um, I didn't talk about, you could do some of the second also. Yeah, because the second one talks about multiplication rule as well. I did not talk about conditional probability, so if you hear anything about find the probability of this given that, we didn't do that, and we didn't do at least one. So if you see those, we didn't do those, but you could do some of the second assignment also because there's some or cases, there's some um, multiplication rule. They talk about multi, uh, uh, mutually exclusive. And then I have to do a little bit with the formula and the multiplication rule. So tomorrow I'll be able to cover. What time tomorrow, Professor? Same time, conditional probability, probability of at least one, and then, let me, I'm sorry, I forgot to stop recording. <laughs> and